This video lecture discusses DNA. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through Ohio University's Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom program. Have you ever wondered what makes organisms different? What makes people different from animals? What makes animals different from plants? Let's use these horses as an example. Take a few moments to discuss how these horses are different. Look at their collar, size, body structure, and any other features you might notice that are different. These are obviously different breeds of horses, but what makes breeds of a certain species different from one another? How are the traits for each breed passed along through the generations? Just looking at these six horses has given us a lot of questions, so let's find out the answers. The differences between the horses we just looked at, and between all organisms, are encoded in their DNA. DNA is an acronym for deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is responsible for storing, copying, and transmitting the genetic information that determines an organism's characteristics. How does the information contained in DNA manifest itself as characteristics? The information encoded in DNA is actually an amino acid sequence. This amino acid sequence determines the protein that will be formed, and the protein determines the structure and function of the cells. That means the DNA for each type of cell carries the unique amino acid sequence, which are the instructions for a specific protein for that cell type. We now know that DNA carries the instructions that are necessary for determining the structure and function of cells. But where can DNA be found? DNA is stored in the 46 chromosomes within the cell's nucleus. That means that 3 billion base pairs of DNA are stored in a space that's about 6 microns wide. Let's try to put this measurement into perspective with things we're familiar with. Some of the tiniest things we can think of are measured in hundreds of microns. The diameter of a human hair is 100 microns. So imagine how incredibly small 6 microns would be. To fit in this tiny space, we would expect DNA to be very small. But a single molecule of DNA is actually almost 6 feet long if we were to stretch it out and measure from end to end. How does such a large molecule of DNA fit into this very small space? If we look at the structure of DNA, we will find the answer to our question. The DNA molecule is coiled up in a double helix shape. It has two chains of nucleotides, hence the name double, and it is twisted tight like a spring or coil, which is called a helix. Let's take a closer look at the DNA structure to find out how all the genetic information is encoded. We'll start with the nucleotides, which are the repeating subunits that form the DNA structure. If we look at this diagram of a nucleotide, we can see that there are three parts that form the nucleotide. There is a simple sugar, called deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen base. The nitrogen base of one nucleotide bonds with the nitrogen base of another nucleotide to form a complementary base pair. We notice from this diagram that the nitrogen bases are labeled as either A, C, T, or G. What does this mean? These letters designate the nitrogen base for the nucleotide. There are four possible nitrogen bases, adenine, A, guanine, G, cytosine, C, or thymine, T. These bases bond to form complementary pairs. A always pairs with T, and G always pairs with C. This manner of pairing brings us to Chargaff's rule, which states that the number of A and T must be equal, and the number of G and C must be equal. So far we've looked at the individual nucleotides, but if we remember the DNA structure picture from before, DNA is formed from chains of nucleotides. These chains are formed when the phosphate group of one nucleotide joins with the deoxyribose of another nucleotide. Then we get a single chain of nucleotides that looks like the diagram on the right. Going back to our description of DNA structure as a double helix, we know that DNA is made up of two chains of nucleotides. These chains are held together by bonds between the complementary nitrogen base pairs, 
This bonding can be thought of like a zipper. We can see the zipper likeness in this diagram. The sides of the zipper are made up of the phosphates and sugars, which are held together by covalent bonds. The zipper teeth are formed from the nitrogen base pairs that are hydrogen bonded. With our knowledge of DNA structure, we come across another question. Organisms are all made of DNA that has the same four nucleotides. So how can they be so different? It's true the same four nucleotides are present in all organisms' DNA. But the sequence of the nucleotides is not the same. This sequence is the source of unique genetic material. For example, the sequence ATTGAC does not carry the same information as the sequence TCCAAA. These different sequences are responsible for the differences between organisms. Following the same logic, similarities between DNA nucleotide sequences indicate a relationship between organisms. More closely related organisms will have more similarities between their nucleotide sequences. New DNA molecules are formed through a process called replication. During replication, the DNA is unzipped by an enzyme that breaks the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen base pairs. Now we have two separate nucleotide chains. Free floating nucleotides bond with the unzipped nitrogen bases on each chain so that two new DNA molecules are formed that are identical to the original molecule. We can consider replication in two stages. One, the DNA molecule is unzipped. And two, free nucleotides bond with the unzipped nucleotides. The result is two identical DNA molecules. We now know how genetic information is stored in DNA, and that this information is used to make proteins that determine the function and structure of cells. But what exactly happens for DNA to produce proteins? We can think of the protein building process like an assembly line. The DNA holds the instructions for building the protein from amino acids, like a blueprint contains the instructions for building a car from all the different parts. RNA uses the instructions contained in the DNA to bring the amino acids and assemble them in the correct order to form the protein. Going back to our assembly line analogy, the DNA is like the engineer with the blueprints. It tells the RNA, which are the workers, how to construct the protein. Before we go any further into the formation of proteins, let's take a minute to learn more about RNA, or ribonucleic acid, and how it's different from DNA. Remember that DNA is made up of two strands of nucleotides, but RNA has only one strand. We notice another difference just by paying attention to the names. Deoxyribonucleic acid contains the sugar deoxyribose, while ribonucleic acid contains the sugar ribose. Both DNA and RNA have four nitrogen bases. Remember the nitrogen bases for DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. RNA has the same nitrogen bases as DNA, except for one. Instead of thymine, RNA has the nitrogen base uracil. There are three different types of RNA, and each performs a specific function. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, takes the instructions from the DNA in the nucleus to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. The ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. The mRNA attaches to the ribosome and gives out the instructions it's carried from the DNA for assembling the amino acids. Transfer RNA, or tRNA, brings the amino acids to the ribosome. The ribosome uses the instructions brought by the mRNA to assemble the amino acids brought by the tRNA to form the protein. Let's look at what happens during each step of this process. First, let's consider the mRNA. How does it get the information from the DNA? mRNA is made through a process called transcription. Five things happen during this process. First, an enzyme unzips the DNA molecule. Then, free RNA nucleotides pair with the complementary nitrogen bases on the DNA strand. Once the RNA nucleotides are paired up with their complementary bases, the nucleotides bond to form the mRNA strand. After the mRNA strand has formed, 
It breaks away from the DNA strand and leaves on its way to the ribosome, at which point the DNA strands rejoin. If we look at a diagram of the transcription process, we can see how the red RNA nucleotides bond with the nitrogen bases on the unzipped blue DNA strand. Notice that G bonds with C, but A bonds with U instead of T, since the fourth nitrogen base for RNA is uracil. We can see from this diagram how the nitrogen base sequence is copied or transcribed into the mRNA as the complementary bases. The information carried by the mRNA is like a coded message. Since the mRNA strand is made up of the nitrogen bases that are complementary to the DNA strand, we know what the DNA bases are. For example, if the mRNA strand is GCUGAU, then the DNA bases are CGA, CTA. But how is this message used to build protein? The message carried by mRNA doesn't just tell us the sequence of DNA bases. It's actually a series of codons. Codons are groups of three nitrogen bases that code the instructions for building the protein. The codons are arranged in specific sequence for a particular protein. Some of the codons code for amino acids, while others code for starting and stopping the protein chain. Let's look at a table of mRNA codons that tells us the amino acids that are represented by different codons. If we have the codon GAA, we know that this corresponds to the amino acid glutamate. Notice the codon AUG is for the amino acid methionine, which starts the protein chain. And the codons UAA, UAG, and UGA stop the protein chain. What must happen in order to crack that coded message carried by mRNA? As with any language, translation occurs. During the translation process, the information coded in the nitrogen-based sequences is translated into a sequence of amino acids. This is where tRNA comes into play. The tRNA has an anticodon made up of base pairs that are complementary to the bases of an mRNA codon. Each anticodon corresponds to a single amino acid that is attached to the tRNA. Let's take a closer look at each step that takes place during the process of translation. After the ribosome attaches to the mRNA, tRNA molecules begin to approach the ribosome. The first codon on this mRNA strand is AUG, so the tRNA anticodon must be UAC. The codon AUG codes for the amino acid methionine that starts the protein chain. This amino acid is attached to the tRNA molecule with the anticodon UAC. The nitrogen bases of the codon and anticodon bond, and the first tRNA molecule is in place. The tRNA molecule that matches the next mRNA codon attaches to the mRNA strand and joins with the previous tRNA molecule through a peptide bond. Once the peptide bond forms, the ribosome moves along the mRNA strand and the first tRNA molecule is released because it no longer holds an amino acid. The next tRNA molecule in the sequence attaches to the mRNA strand and the amino acid carried by this tRNA bonds with the previous amino acid. This process continues and the chain of amino acids grows until the stop codon is reached. The stop codon ends the chain, indicating that the new protein has been formed. This process of building proteins through transcription and translation is known as protein synthesis. Protein synthesis forms the central dogma of biology, which states that information flows from DNA to mRNA to the protein. These DNA discoveries have been relatively recent, occurring within the last century, especially during the 1950s. Between 1951 and 1953, Rosalind Franklin discovered the helix pattern of DNA. In 1952, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase determined through their experiments that DNA is the genetic material. Then in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick proposed the structure of DNA in a publication. In 
For more practice understanding the structure of DNA and the associated processes, the following activities are available. In the DNA isolation activity, you can extract DNA from a bacterial suspension of lima beans. In the human cheek cell activity, you will be able to see your own DNA. In the DNA 3D model activity, you will use candy to build a model of DNA, pair nitrogen bases, and translate the codons into amino acids. In the protein synthesis activity, you will work as a class to act out the steps involved in protein synthesis. Finally, you can use the review game to study the material you